welcome to the 12th annual Flashback Weekend Chicago Horror Convention. Let's make some noise! Are you ready for Freddy? Good evening, my name is Dan Geyer, I'm film critic of the Daily Herald, and I have the honor of serving as your figurehead, Master of Ceremonies. Welcome here. Now, 12 years ago, Mike and Mia Kurz had a dream. They wanted to put on a horror convention, but they had no way of doing it by themselves, but yet that's the only way they could do it because they couldn't raise any capital. And so Mike and Mia Kurz, they sank their personal fortune, their house, and their funds into a risky proposition, and it became Flashback Weekend. Yeah! They had a couple of years where they broke even. They had a few years where they went in the red. But at no time did they give up. Their spirits were never daunted because they knew that if they built it, you would storm it. And you have. So give yourself a round of applause for making this dream come true. Now Mike and Mia Kurz would normally be like any capitalist pigs, and they would take all the money that you find people have given us to get into this place and go to Tahiti or buy bullion or some such stuff. No. They take their money, their proceeds from this event, and they bundle it into the Midway Drive-In that Mike and Mia purchased a few years ago because they believe that the American Drive-In is important to preserve as a cultural and entertainment piece of history. So all the money that you make, that they make from this event this weekend is going to keep that operation moving. And for those of you who remember the famous words of the world's greatest drive-in movie critic, Joe Bob Briggs. The drive-in will never die. <laughs> and thanks to Mike and Mia Kurz, you and this convention, the drive-in, will never die. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Enough of this stuff. Are you ready for Freddy? Pretty good. He's coming. In the meantime, I want you to, I'm going to introduce two of my favorite fellow critics, Steve Prokofi and Nick DeGilio. Come on up. How's it going? Hey guys, uh, we've been a part of this thing for all 12 years. It it's just keeps getting bigger and better. I've never seen an opening day this Crazy. Yeah, Jesus, you guys are nuts. Uh, it's like there's something big going on. Uh, no. Uh, today. But, uh, <laughs> they have padded chairs up here. I know, why can't we leave this up here? Normally they have stools it's that really hurt my ass. Yeah. There's padded chairs. Uh, just a couple of notes about uh, the next couple of days when we got all the Q and A's and stuff. Uh, uh, there's one thing in particular. We got we got a ton of stuff coming out. Uh, all, well, you can look at the schedule, look at the Q and A's. But one thing I want to tell you in particular is that for those of you who went downstairs and, and got your picture taken with Robert England and the Freddy makeup, the, the makeup guru, Robert Kurtzman, uh, made a duplicate set of sort of the applications of the Freddy makeup. And tomorrow there, there's a Robert England Q&A at 8.15 in here, uh, and they're gonna auction off that set to whoever you know gives up the most money. And, uh, and obviously all that money will go right into the drive, and like Dan said. So uh, be absolutely be sure to come, and, and Kurtzman's gonna have a booth in there tomorrow, so go visit him, go check out all the different you know, movie makeups he's done. He's got piece man pictures of all of them for you. But yeah, come back here for the applications, the Freddy applications, he designed them, uh, he put them on, I saw them touching him up downstairs earlier, so, uh, and I'm guessing he touched them up a little while ago before he comes out of here. Uh, and that's all I have to say, so thank, thank you guys, and, and Nick's gonna, Tell you about some of the things going on. Yeah, okay, so a uh, bunch of Q&A is going on tomorrow uh, and all kinds of really cool stuff. 
Uh, make sure you do that. My eight, by the way, uh, how many people have bought a flashback t-shirt this year? Yeah, I, that's not enough arms. So you need to buy a flashback t-shirt, which is going to be available there. It's really cool. It commemorates this year, and uh, you know, there's Phantasm on the back and Nightmare on the front. I will be, by the way, emceeing the Phantasm concert tomorrow night in here. Yeah, let's hear it. I saw Phantasm, um, I'm not kidding, in the theater about 112 times, and I'm not exaggerating. And uh, uh, they're showing it downstairs at 6 p.m. on Saturday. Um, so, anyway, uh, we gotta get going. Uh, this is, uh, we got a video here to, uh, to introduce what's going on. Everybody have a really good time. Make sure you come back, go to the dealer room, buy stuff, have fun. Give it up, let's go. set to go on the air at WFLD here in Chicago, and at the time I was just a freelance guy, and I didn't have the money to buy a theatrical wig, which was very expensive, so I thought, well, I'll go to Kmart, they have this big bar of women's wigs there, and went in there, and the young lady was there, and it, you know, this one was $29, look, where's my iron, it's still good, and, and I told her, I'm going to be doing a TV show, and I need this wig, so it should be perfect, you know, and, and this is great, it's affordable and everything else, she goes, yeah. We get a lot of gay guys coming in here by way <laughs> And I said, you know, no, I'm straight, and not that there's anything wrong with it. And I, I said, I tell you what, you tune in on, I think it was the exact day of the broadcast, and it was all set. And then they delayed the uh, beginning of the show for a month after that. So somewhere this young woman is, I don't know. Anyway, I'm Sven Bully. I've been Sven Bully now for 35 years. <laughs> I'm still doing it, and if you think about it, if back in 1979 I would have killed somebody, I would have gotten out like five years ago and I'd be done with it. But that's not quite the case. This is the world's smallest cue card here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I, I was on the cover of a broadcast magazine, Broadcast and Cable, this week, and I never heard so many industry people say they were glad there wasn't a centerfold. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, if it was Elvira, it would be different. People always ask, oh, you're like Elvira, and I said, well, Kind of, but without the topography, it's a little bit different. <laughs> uh, I met Elvira at one of these flashback weekend conventions, and she was very sweet, very nice. We were going to take a picture together, which I thought was cool, and I thought, I've got to do something to you know, raise some, some interest in this. So I said, what would it take for you to kiss me? And she said, chloroform. <laughs> I don't know. You, you know, in so many years, you have an effect on people. Such when people come up to me and say how much they enjoy what I do, and uh, it means a lot to me. One of the best stories I heard, a young lady started working with us, and she said that her mother came from Poland many years ago, and the way she learned to speak English was from watching two TV shows, my show and Sesame Street. <laughs> and I think it's kind of funny, her uh, immigrant friends must have been confused by her constant use of the phrases Berwin and me want cookie. <laughs> We have an incredible show coming up for you tonight. Uh, we were going to do an audience participation thing, but I want to get somebody out here right away. So we'll be right back after this commercial. <laughs> Maybe she's just trying to find the stud. 
Hey, Barry. <laughs> you know, nothing would help more for that than the classic LP that put the romantic side of Freddy Krueger on the charts with a bullet, or maybe a knife. He's best known for portraying Freddy Krueger in the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Here in his full Freddy makeup for the final time, please welcome Robert England. Contributing to uh, Mike and Mia's great uh, vision, which is saving movie theaters, drive-in theaters. That's where I lost it. That's where my cherry was popped. <laughs> I was in the back seat. Christopher Lee was on the big screen. You know, I mean, I didn't have enough money. It was a double date. That's how intimate we were. But uh, no, I just think it's a great piece of Americana and American culture, and uh, I'm glad to be part of this. Uh, Mike and Mia and Flashback has been so great to me over the years. We got to premiere a couple of my films here and, and have some great screenings. So, yeah, I, I don't know if this is the last time. No. Uh, I'll tell you right now, it's, it's, I'm, I can't wait to tear it off. <laughs> starting to get kind of itchy, but uh, I'm just happy to be here at Flashback. Let's get ready to party! Put on that makeup. This was the Robert Kurtzman streamline, and he took parts of three and four and combined them for this particular uh, convention. And we got it done, I think, in about two and a half hours, wow. which is a record. It's normally three to get me camera ready for a really long shot because I didn't, I didn't put in the contact lenses or the teeth. Sure. I just blackened my teeth with the. Uh, the hotel pizza. <laughs> I saw in the interview you talked about the reason that you did not wear the hat. Would you, would you tell her? No, I mean, I, you know, and I got all this grief on the internet, you know, I got reamed for not wearing the hat. And the reason is, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary 
of Nightmare on Elm Street. We're celebrating Flashback Weekend. And we're celebrating me, yours truly, Robert England, in the makeup for you fans. We're not celebrating just Freddy, because just Freddy, you can find him on Hollywood Boulevard, out in front of the Jimmy Kimmel show, <laughs> getting beat up, and you can find him at Universal Studios, and it's some guy who's in the My Little Pony show, <laughs> but it's not Halloween, and you can find him at, at, at Universal Studios LA, you know, and it, it, it's some guy from uh, Did You Learn How to Dance, or one of those shows. <laughs> so this is me, you're getting me, and, and, and I want it with a hat on, and with a sweater on, I look like an impersonator. This is me, in a, and you'll know it, in a flashback t-shirt. And I'm able to get the light in my eyes. These are my eyes, they're not the contact lenses. And the fans that had their pictures taken know that. So that's what was commemorative about it. Yeah, you see the middle of that hat? If I were in that hat, I look like Donald O'Connor and, you know. <laughs> It takes us ten tries with a hat when we do the movie, let alone Chicago, and, and, and nobody knows what size my head is in the makeup. Now, I've told you before, I love your book, Hollywood Monster. If you haven't read it, please pick it up. One of the things I want to ask you about is there's a couple stories in there of when you were making the first movie, the times that you would go off the studio premises and maybe surprise a few people. Well, I went to a, 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 a wedding, my agent, uh, his fiance, who had a, a bachelorette party. And uh, I went to that. And, you know, LA is famous for its misuse of L outdoor lighting. You know, we have these lights out, out outside all of our houses, you know, to light the plants, I guess. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's usually in green or blue or yellow. It's, it's, a, it's a Southern California affectation. And here I am underneath the kitchen window of this mid-century house somewhere in the San Fernando Valley. And the girls are all in the kitchen washing this grandmother's expensive crystal from a champagne toast uh, of, of the, all the girls of the bridesmaids. And I rise up slowly in full makeup <laughs> after the after shooting, and I rise up very slowly to look in. And these girls are beautiful. These are the, the pick of the crop. And uh, I, I rise up to you know to scare them, and I'm bottom lit by the sort of dashboard lighting of outdoor Southern California landscaping lighting. And I got up, and they dropped all of the crystal glasses. <laughs> One of the girls passed out and fell in the glass. So that was a big lesson about not, you know, going out in, in the real world as Freddy anymore. And only we, we didn't quite draw the line in the sand yet. We, we went out on Sunset Boulevard one night when I had a huge gap in the filming, but they left me in the makeup for six or seven hours before they needed to get this last shot. And so I jumped in a limo with some buddies of mine, and then we pulled up to a couple of street walkers on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> My friends wanted to know if, if they were patriotic. They said, ladies, we know we have a, we have a Vietnam veteran. <laughs> <laughs> burn victim in the war. And could you possibly see it in your heart to service him? The girl toddled over in all of her 80s acid-washed denim and looked in the window, cleavage, <laughs> and her jean jacket and the big 80s hair. And of course, I wheeled around and went, Can you do me, baby? <laughs> the last I saw her, she was running back into a motel. <laughs> Not a friend of mine, uh, who is involved in the Star Wars movies, said that you were actually responsible for him getting the part that he's famous for. I think you know what I'm talking well, about. Well, no, I, no, I'm not, listen, everybody, this is the internet again. No, I went up for, I went up for uh, the, the surfer in Apocalypse Now, and I was too old. I wanted to be uh, up for the cook, played by the great uh, Frederick Forrest. And I was too young for that part, but I was, you know, a young buff surfer then. Uh, in my skin tight green Levi's, and I, I had a, a thrift shop uh, army shirt on, and they looked at me and they said, Well, they sent me across the hall with this project by Francis Ford Coppola called Star Wars, and they looked at me for Harrison Ford. Well, I was too young for Harrison, for her, you know, the, the Han Solo role, because they, they needed somebody to look older, you know, than, than, than Luke Skywalker. 
So I went out drinking and I went home and on my couch passed out in front of a rerun of Mary Tyler Moore was my buddy Mark Hamill. <laughs> and I told him all about this and I said, you know, you might like this. Now Mark was already had been published. Three letters had been published in Famous Monsters magazine. Mark was a huge genre fan, like many of you. And Mark got on the horn and called his agent and went up for Luke Skywalker, and the rest is history. Yeah, he said the same to you. Well, he's in the gym right now for the new Star Wars. And by the way, the lead, I believe, is this kid I've been tipping for a couple of years. That was in Attack the Block. Woo! Yeah, I think he's the new star of Star Wars. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Mark Campbell tells me he's wearing his Spenzuli t-shirt. <laughs> on the uh, sound stage there. I think Mark saw you, actually, as a child. I think his father might have passed through here or been stationed here. He was an army yeah, brat. Yeah, he or a navy brat or an army brat, yeah. And he, he, he contacted me when he was seeing us on uh, Me TV LA, and I was just so surprised. First, I didn't believe it was him. Yeah. And uh, so finally he posted something on Twitter, and I was like, well, it's got to be him. Well, I mean, did... And I've always wanted to ask you this question. This is as good a time as any. I've had a couple of glasses of wine. Um, <laughs> did Joe Flaherty homage you a little bit on I CTV? It was originally, the original Spengoolie was the guy that got me into the business, Jerry yeah. G. Bishop, yeah. who was doing his Spengoolie show at the time that Joe was in Chicago. In Chicago. Yeah. So, so I who's think scared? Scared me. It's it's his body. Body. It'll make your hands go like this. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that. Oh, that was All so right. You've got to admit. Oh, no. Is that? Look at Lance. It's bigger than me on this. I hate this. Look at Lance's action figure here. Look at here. No, right here in the desk. I'm sorry. Hey. No, but look at, look at that. Look at Lance's action figure. It's bigger than that's me. your mini me. I know. That's the mini me. Lance Hendrickson. The great Lance Hendrickson is, is, is alien. is getting the best of Freddy. Oh, you don't to worry about it. Now, you are really. There was the first generation of horror icons with the Frankenstein monster and. Uh, the Wolfman, and you actually were one of the second, you know, newer group, the new horror writer. Yeah. And did you used to watch the old horror movies? See, I was a snob all through the 60s and 70s, and I forgot, uh, conveniently or through pressure from uh, all of those, you know, people taking themselves too seriously, I kind of abandoned these moments that I had as a child that were very memorable to me. And they began as far back as uh, Forbidden Planet, uh, and they worked their way up. I mean, I, I can remember uh, people drawing uh, in, in, in elementary school the monster from the id. We were trying to figure out what it was, and it took us, you know, there's no pause button in those days, and there was no replay and no DVDs, or, and, and in fact, you had to watch it at the matinee or wait for it to come on the late show on television. And we, I remember my buddy Ronnie Walker in the third grade, screaming out in the middle of, of math, it's a saber-toothed tiger! <laughs> and we realized what the monster of the id was in Forbidden Planet. So starting there, and for many, many years, yeah, I loved uh, the horror. And, and I think that some of my favorites, well, special, oh, Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, uh, you know, and then I didn't, you know, really discover Karloff until the late 50s or early 60s, because that's when it came around again. Sure. You know? yeah. and, uh, and, and in fact, my first Hollywood lunch, I sat in a booth next to Elsa Lancaster, wow. the bride of Frankenstein and her entourage. So it's, it's sort of a small world, but I kind of buried all of that, and I'm not sure why, but I kind of buried that, and a couple of years ago I remembered going to my godfather's home and looking at a coffee table book uh, of Life Magazine Goes to the Movies. And in the coffee table book was two pages of Lon Chaney and all the various makeups that he'd done, wow. including the one where he boils the egg and takes the placentia from a hard-boiled egg and puts it over his eye uh, in order to look blind. Uh, probably the first contact lens. This is a silent movie. At any rate, long story short, I did and was a fanboy from the very beginning. I lost my way. And it took Wes Craven to remind me of, of how important that is for the childhood imagination and, and the young pre-adolescent imagination. And I kind of made peace with, with the fact that that's who I was before I was a Shakespearean actor, before I was an off-Broadway actor, before I was a theater actor, before I started doing movies. And, uh, 
it took me a while, uh, but I, 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 you know, owe less for that, you know, to get that, that hindsight. I think the best way to go through life is to, to understand high and low culture. Sure. You know, I, I think a redneck country western anthem can be as important as a great Dylan song. You know, sure. yeah, I think people need to expose themselves to so many. Yeah, high, things. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a great thing, and, and it doesn't. It's not really a judgment. It's just that's just the way they break it down now. But yeah, I was a, I was a fanboy. Yeah. And, and now, once a fanboy, always a fanboy. <laughs> and now, <laughs> you take the boy out of the matinee, but you can't take the matinee out of the boy. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna have some of your former co-stars cool out here. Okay. And what I want to do is I'll give you the name. Yep. And you just give me a short phrase. The, the way they'll describe quickly because this okay. is beginning to end. You've got okay. First, Amanda Witz. Oh, Amanda, my gosh. Well, I don't think uh, here. Okay, Amanda, I think was brawless in Nightmare One. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about Ronnie Blakely? Oh, Ronnie, my God! I just want you all at some point to rent Nashville, the Robert Altman film, and watch Ronnie in that. That was her Oscar-nominated uh, performance, and she is truly. Truly ephemeral in that way. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Uh, okay. How about Jennifer Rubin? Oh, Jennifer. Well, here's my Jennifer Rubin story. She may not remember this, but she, you know, we all bitch about the makeup effects. I mean, Lance Hendrickson, you know, you know, in the Alien films had extensive makeup in days where he was half buried up to his tits, you know, in, in a hole <laughs> on a James Cameron set. And me, I've had some rough days over the years. Sure. In, in, in several films, not just the nightmare films, but Jennifer Rubin did a makeup effect for the the uh, arms, the junky arms with the little mouths on them of her track marks, the let's get high you know, sequence from from that film, and they walked, they they looked at the film to do her effects, and they held it the wrong way. You know, they used to look at film and say, "All right, we got to put the makeup effects on this side of her." And they did this like incredible detail, once off, seven hour makeup on her, I think. And they put it on the wrong side. So I think that Jennifer had this like 24 hour day in makeup. And then they had to like, like kind of hold her down on the set and everything. And I remember coming in the next day, you can ask Jennifer this, but on the mirror in the makeup room, She'd written this sad little message in a little stick, you know. <laughs> we all thought she'd been kidnapped. <laughs> it was like she had a really, really bad day. Oh, yeah. How about Monica Keenan? Oh, the lovely Monica. Well, you know, Monica. What I, my great memory of Monica on this movie was Monica was because she had. She's our sexy survivor girl. Monica couldn't wear a wetsuit unless she had. Unless she had a wetsuit panties on that I don't know about. Um, Monica was actually out there at that goddamn Crystal Lake in Canada. She was out there in her real wardrobe along with Jason Ritter. Both Jason and I were able to hide the uh, wetsuits beneath our outfits. And so we could survive in the lake in the fall of 2003. But I remember after every take, we would all rush and jump into, they had a hot tub on the set for us, so we wouldn't get hypothermia. And it was very surreal, because there would be two Navy SEALs in Arctic suits, I don't know what they're doing in the hot tub, actually. <laughs> they're in the hot tub because of Monica. And uh, Jason Ritter, Monica, myself, and Ken Kirsten, it was Jason, six foot seven Jason, Freddy Krueger, the lovely, beautiful Monica Kina, the heart rate of the entourage. And uh, Jason Ritter, all of us in the hot tub together after every take. <laughs> and, was, and I know somewhere there's a great publicity photo of that, or a great set still. I've never seen it, but I want one for my office wall. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Robert Rustler. Oh, Robert. Well, Robert, you know, and I, we worked hard on that because we were in this incredible sequence where I have to kind of come out of the Mark the right. Patton character, and that was so exacting. And and though, though that was like that was my nightmare in Elm Street Part Two, so that was very early on into the franchise, and that was one of the longest, hardest days. And I know yeah. that, that Robert had to like be there, even though he wasn't, you know, the effect. Sure, Robert had to be there for all of that because he was he was part of the sequence, and that was a that was a pitch of the day. Oh man! Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple questions here from a couple people in the audience that we will do because I know you want to get out of here, yeah. and we're trying to make <laughs> that expressly. Please, can we have the first person with the question, please? Hi, Mr. Um... <laughs> you can 
can call me Fred. <laughs> here, speak into my microphone since we don't seem to have the hand mic that was supposed to be here. Okay, hi, Mr. Kruger. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Um, I was just wondering, me and my family recently moved to an Elm Street in Chicago, but my friend said that you could come and kill me any time I fall asleep, but I think I might be safe because it's not the Elm Street in Springwood. What do you think? <laughs> I just like you speaking into Spanguli's boo. Well, I respect it, it's kind of strange. Now, don't you remember what I quoted so eloquently? Every, every town! Every town has an Elm Street block! Sit down now. Um, hi. Is there a family resemblance? I don't know. Um, There's no collusion here. No collusion yeah. whatsoever. Okay, so I was wondering who was your favorite kill out of everyone? Well, I'd like to say that it was the boy with a hearing aid in part six. <laughs> <laughs> politically incorrect, but just like for an actor, the next job is always his favorite. Every new kill is my favorite. <laughs> 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 oh, I got a hot date here. I got a hot date, and from what I understand, Sven Gulli here is, is, is aligning himself to replace Craig Ferguson, so. <laughs> Robert, let me just say that we all appreciate your helping out the Midway Drive-In and giving the fans a chance to see you in this one final Well, I'm here all weekend, you guys, so come stop by. <laughs>